And finally tonight, Ray Suarez handles our regular look at the campaign as it played out in social media and on the web. For that, we're joined again by two journalists from the website Daily Download. Lauren Ashburn is the site's editor-in-chief. Howard Kurtz is Newsweek's Washington bureau chief and host of CNN's Reliable Sources. Well, we've been talking for months about the new ways of doing politics during this election season online. How, Lauren, how much did the campaigns end up spending? Ten to one ratio. Take a look at this. The Obama campaign spent $47 million on digital spending, and the Romney campaign spent $4.7 million. A ten to one gap. Do we know what the Obama campaign realized in that kind of spending advantage? Did they get much for their buck? Well, he won, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> that does kind of settle the argument. The Obama campaign believed from the start that digital was an important new area and really had an almost evangelical feeling about signing people up to register to give money through Facebook and Twitter. The Romney campaign obviously got a later start because he was not the incumbent, but also I think didn't quite have the fervent belief that this de de deserved a lot of resources. The Romney campaign, however, did have a computer based modeling system like the Obama campaign what was it called Orca Orca like the whale mm -hmm. and it failed <laughs> by all accounts it didn't do what it was supposed to do on election day which was to get to find out who was voting and who wasn't so they could get the supporters out to make sure that those people were voting. And the Romney campaign did put a lot of resources into that system, and unfortunately for that side, it crashed. A lot of volunteers went home. They couldn't get the information about identifying voters, and this was supposed to be its answer to the vaunted Obama ground game, the president's uh, team that he had, had spent a couple years putting in place. And now, coming back to this question of digital spending, if you go to the next graphic, look at the increase from 2008 when the president, when then candidate Obama, spent $16 million, zooming up to $47 million dollars uh, for the 2012. And 2008 was supposed to be the social media campaign and, and look at it now. It's continuing and there are some questions as to whether or not 2016 will be another social media campaign or will we be on to something new. Now here was another example of how the Obamas never stopped running. The campaign never really stopped. They just kept upping the investment in the online world as we proceeded through that first term. Now, let's talk about interactivity, because that's part of the gold standard of this, right? I mean, Pete, you don't just want cute cat pictures and people <laughs> playing with their dogs. You want people uh, engaged in electoral politics. And it happened. People weren't just looking at those cute kitties. They were announcing their votes on social media. If you look at the amount of Obama supporters, 25 percent of them actually announced who they were voting for, and 20 percent of the Romney supporters did that, almost even. So the Facebooks and the Twitters were able, the, the Twitter was Twitters. able, <laughs> Twitterers were able to get that information out, and it encouraged their friends and family to A, vote, or to be vote for the candidate that their friend was voting for. And I think that's the key, Lauren, because, you know, we're all accustomed to getting bombarded by messages from political PACs as well as the campaigns themselves. When you see that your friend, that your followers, that your uncle, um, or voting for President Obama, voting for Mitt Romney, um, that has a subtle form of exertion. And in this same study, it comes from the Pew Internet uh, group, um, we found out that a lot of people were lobbied online through social media to support one candidate or the other. And there was an age split there as well. Well, when you look at Facebook, if you have a number of friends and they have various uh, political beliefs, they would attach articles that they had seen, um, magazine pieces, TV pieces that they had seen that they wanted you to see. So unlike an ad from nowhere, it was from somebody you actually knew in real life. Right. And I spoke to a lot of people all across the country who told me that if they didn't like what someone was saying on Facebook or Twitter, Ding. unfollow, unfriend. Yeah. And so it wound up that there's this microcosm of people who believe what you believe. So when those articles are shared, they're more likely to be read. Well, I hope some of those friendships come back now that the election is behind us. But you talked about 2016. Uh, already we are seeing that um, if you look at the age breakdown, 45 percent, almost half of those who were in that 18 to 29 age group, uh, said they were lobbied online through social media by friends or family to vote for one candidate or the other. If you were over 65, it's only 11 percent. 
But as that population ages, it's going to become second nature for people to engage, lobby, share politics online. What I found interesting is that people would actually say who they voted for. It used to be there was this cloak of secrecy. No one would really say who they voted Privacy for. Privacy of the voting booth. The curtain is pulled. Nobody well, knows. Nothing is private on the Internet, <laughs> as we've said many times. It's interesting that you mention people unfriending over this, because that tends to intensify the fact that the people you talk to in your circle are more and more like you, which is what people who buy eyeballs online really want. They do. The idea that you're like a lot of other people who are in your group. Therefore, if you put the ad on one person's Facebook page, it's more likely to be shared and shared and shared again and again with the people who are their friends. Lauren, Howard, good to see you both. Thanks, you too.